Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. I feel very humbled uh, to be here speaking to you today, not just with uh, folks in the audience, but also uh, the other speakers. So people would call me a space garbage man, and I'm actually a bit proud of that. Like uh, was mentioned earlier, I worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. You may have seen me in the movie The Martian. OK, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Astrodynamicist, right? So very cool job to work on Mars missions. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the high-rise camera that just took really awesome pictures of the water flow on Mars, I actually was part of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission that got it there. So then it's like, well, if you're doing all this cool stuff, you're sending stuff to Mars, why the space garbage kind of thing? All right, so you can't just go to school and, and study to be a space garbage person. I studied astrodynamics, and basically that's the science that studies the behavior of objects in space. How do these things behave, where they're gonna go to, and I'm gonna show you exactly why that's very, very, very important. Now, all of us depend on things that are in space. We heard it earlier uh, during the first talk, but everybody has a smartphone. Uh, you know, the last time that I took out a map and unfolded it to try to figure out how to get from point A to point B, that was a really, really long time ago, right? Everybody has this nice iPhone, smartphone. You turn it on, you see yourself as a blue dot. You get these nice turn-by-turn -turn instructions. Left in 500 feet and .2 miles, you're gonna, you know, I have no idea how I'd figure my way around Boston if it wasn't because of, you know, one of these iPhones. But what's the thing that's telling you this position? It's a space capability. It's a space service that the Air Force provides to the globe through the GPS system. Air traffic is managed by this sort of thing. I mean, pretty much all position navigation and timing is really harnessed by space capabilities. And you depend on a thing. When you pull out that phone and you're trying to figure out where you're gonna go, you expect to see that blue dot. You think that's guaranteed? It's not guaranteed. And that's what I'm here to tell you. It's not a guaranteed thing. Also, you go to some foreign country, you go to the ATM, you expect to get some cash. Satellites uh, you know, are part of bank routing systems. That's also not guaranteed. That would be a bad day. We also depend on space to become aware of things like weather, right? We can get predictions days, weeks in advance of storms that tell us and our loved ones, you need to mobilize, you need to go here, you need to go there because something impending is coming your way and you can see it but that's not guaranteed. So what am I really talking about with this whole space garbage and whatnot? Here we go. So this is a video courtesy of NASA's Orbital Debris Program Office at Johnson Space Center. And all those dots that you see are part of a catalog, a database that the US Department of Defense tries to maintain on a daily basis of about 22,000 objects. Out of the 22,000 objects, about 10 centimeters in diameter and larger, only about 1,200 work. Everything else is trash. And the problem is getting worse. Why? Because we keep on putting things into space until the population is growing. Uh, every so often, every couple of years, two things collide with each other, make more pieces, more fragments. So what are we talking about in terms of the fragments? Well, you see these things zooming past each other, some of them in, in low Earth orbit. You have a huge concentration in, in low Earth orbit. Uh, these things are basically remnants of satellites, cooler covers, bolts and nuts that have popped off, uh, you know, s s rocket bodies uh, that are defunct. Again, pieces of satellites that have collided and are just aimlessly going around in orbit. So you'd think, okay, well, is any of this stuff cleaning itself up naturally? Well, if things are sufficiently low, right, you get atmospheric uh, interactions such that the thing starts slowing down and it re-enters. So you get about two to three things a day that re-enter. That's not sufficient to clean up this mess. And in fact, most of the things, like you see that nice ring, that's the geostationary ring. That's what I call the Goldilocks. It's basically you know, based on gravitational influences. If you wanted to have a communication satellite, something like DirecTV, it's the perfect place to put it because the time it takes for that satellite to go once around its orbit is equivalent to an Earth day, about 24 hours. That means that you can be at your house, you have a nice dish, you could point it to a general place in the sky and the satellite's pretty much gonna be in that general place. So if you don't wanna fight gravity, 
that's where you put your satellites for direct TV and comm. If that becomes useless, we're in big trouble, big trouble, because there's no other place to put it. And that means that to get the same kind of service, you're going to have to spend a lot of propellant thrusting yourself around to fight gravity. Fighting gravity is a bad thing. Okay? We don't want to do that. All right, so, wow, Marie, but that doesn't sound like good news. You're right. It's a good question. You're right. It doesn't, doesn't sound good. So what, what, who's involved? It's not just a US problem. It's a global problem. It affects all nations. And the thing is, we want to make sure that we can preserve this space environment, not just for our generation, but future generations. AFRL is doing world-class research from Maui all the way to the East Coast, working very closely with academia, with private industry. We participate at the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. We participate in NATO. NATO's trying to figure out how to really understand what's going on in the space domain, predict behavior, right? Be able to predict when things are going to collide with each other, when things are going to re-enter. So it's a global problem, and the thing is we need more people to get involved. Right now we have what I would call the one-size-fits-all kind of space surveillance mentality. We have detections, and we kind of try to piece those detections with unique objects. So that's very difficult. You know, when you try to understand a population of objects here on Earth or a population of living things, right, what do you do? You tag the thing and you track the thing for a long period of time, and you try to understand how that thing interacts with the environment to understand what the population is doing. Case in point, Maui has this nice little experiment of trying to figure out where sharks, tiger sharks are at. What do you have to do? You have to go up to it, tag it. I'm not going to do that. That's somebody else's job. Um, I'm, I'm allergic to shark bites. Um, you have to go up to it, tag it, and then track it. And then discovery happens. My goodness, I had no idea that these tiger sharks every Tuesday went to the same beach to get fish from the same fishermen. You know, what have you. That is how you understand a population. We can't go up to every single thing and tag it. We don't have the resources to do that. Just to go up to something, it's like the same amount of money that you would have to put something that works is the same amount of money or even more that you'd have to use to go up to it, tag it, or bring it back. So economically, it's not very feasible. Politically speaking, well, if some other country, country X, went to country's Y, mil dead military satellite, to try to bring it down, country Y might have a problem with that. So there's political issues. There are technical issues. And one of the things that AFRL is trying to do is we're trying to create a taxonomy for artificial space objects. Much like there's a taxonomy for biological systems, we have different classes and species, not everything in space is made the same way. Not everything in space behaves the same way. And if we could create a taxonomy, much like we have for biological systems, that might inform us of data collection strategies, how best to share information to understand what's threatening, what's a hazard. What do we do about the problem? So we're very focused on that. Now, <clears throat> above and beyond that, you know, using these taxonomies, you know, these objects I call gravity an equal oppor opportunity accelerator. It doesn't matter what your shape is or your size. It, it, tell me where you're at, and I can tell you what your acceleration due to gravity is. These objects are all different, really. And so all the non-gravitational forces, solar radiation pressure and all these things, those things care about how the thing is oriented, what it's made out of, how massive it is, because it gets pushed around. But we don't have high rate video to see what all these things look like. We have to infer this through remote sensing. All we get is a collection of dots. And from those dots, we have to be able to say, these are the same things. This is what I saw yesterday or last week. And above and beyond that, from those dots in different wavelengths, we have to reconstruct what the thing's made out of, how it's oriented, so we can try to characterize and classify these things in a different species. So it's extremely, extremely challenging stuff. So it's not as attractive as sending stuff to Mars, but it is something that has an impact on our way of life. Okay? And it's a problem that is just growing. And we need folks such as yourselves to get involved. How do you get involved? Well, uh, you know, my first recommendation, get online, start looking more into space debris. 
There's conferences, there's symposia, there are websites that have a lot of information. Get educated on it. Challenge the people that call themselves experts. Challenge me. Keep me honest, right? But the thing is, is that we all have a stake in this. Space capabilities and services are not guaranteed. And next time you pick up that phone and you go to some place and you don't have this nice map that you can pull out and you depend on that thing, just remember, that is not something that's guaranteed. That thing could go away. And I'm not trying to be alarmist. I'm trying to be a realist. There are real hazards up there. I can't quantify what the risk is. All I can say is that the population is growing. And you can see these things crisscrossing each other at kilometers per second. OK, one kilometer per second is about speed of a bullet, several kilometers per second. And we need to be able to predict when these things are going to collide days in advance so that people can move out of the way. So I want to leave you with, again, we depend on these things. And it's not guaranteed. And we really need to enlist the help of folks such as yourselves. And AFRL is doing a really, really great job of collaborating with people all around the globe to try to make a difference. Thank you very much. <laughs>